I'm Jonathan Goldstein, and you're listening to Wiretap on CBC Radio 1 and Sirius XM. Today's episode, What's the Use? What's the point of getting out of bed in the morning? The world is cold. Like, why get out of bed? So when I was about three, I had one of those inflatable clown dolls that when you punch, they pop right back up. Playing with it nurtured my budding sense of existential futility. In hearing this, you might think to yourself, why, I didn't feel that kind of despair until I was well into my 30s. Well, precocity had its price. At four, I became obsessed with blinking. Should I blink now, I'd wonder? Or now? Should I blink again? I could fathom nothing about adulthood, whether I'd learn to drive or get married. But what I did know with certainty was that there'd be plenty of blinking required, every few seconds, and for decades to come. It filled me with dread. The only place I could relax was in our apartment hallway closet, because in its darkness, I couldn't tell whether my eyes were open or shut, and I could forget. I liked the darkness. I still do. The basic feeling of why leave the closet, why punch the clown, why bother, has always dogged me. Sewn into my heart is this tiny, cruel blade of what's the use that, in my happier moments, morphs into the cozier who gives a shit. If it were up to me, I would just stay in bed. I don't have an alarm, so my alarm is my little sister. This morning she came in and threw water on my face to get me up. And it's like, why do I need to get out of bed? What am I doing with my life? Why can't I just sleep? Well, to me, the point of getting out of bed is if I just, if I get up, then it's one less thing that I have to do and one more thing that I have done. So from then on, I can just keep going. And we'll see what the day brings. I spent my teenage years waiting around for something to happen, feeling stuck in a revolving door going around and around, feeling already old. At 16, I felt past my prime. At 17, I began to lose my hair. At 19, I convened an emergency meeting with my rabbi, thinking maybe I could will myself towards faith, a belief that it was all worthwhile, perhaps hypnotize myself into it, in order to get through life. My rabbi agreed to weekly meetings where together we studied the Hasidic philosophical work, the Tanya. I remember walking home one night after one of our classes, thinking maybe the Tanya was right, that life never ends. But rather than reassuring me, the thought of this perpetuity of the ego, this ceaseless existence, this never being able to escape the stink of your own consciousness, made me grow dizzy and nauseous. It seemed worse than death. I was protective of this thing I knew, that everything was pointless, because I didn't want to contaminate others, make them feel the way I did. Like life was a cosmic gif, a gif in which someone is telling you, over and over, that it's actually pronounced jif. Nietzsche touched on this with his theory of eternal recurrence, the gist of which is that if time and space are infinite, then any set of circumstances will not just happen once, but reoccur an infinite amount of times. On a good day, I don't find this terrifying at all. On a good day, I see this as the kooky imaginings of the gentler, more whimsical Nietzsche. Oh, I'm not talking about the syphilitic ubermensch-obsessed maniac of the later years, shrieking in the agora about the price of onions, but the fresh-faced Nietzsche, who spoke of our living life over and over as the ultimate comedic formula. Once not funny, twice not funny, three times funny, four times funnier, five times not funny anymore, six times not funny, seven times getting funny again, eight times funny, and a trillion times gut-busting. 
when I am feeling sad, it's the point of no return. <laughs> but I guess there's always hope and there's always a point. It's just bad thoughts cycling through your mind and you can break the chain. You can break the chains by paying attention to something else. Take up a Rubik's Cuber. Try babysitting someone's puppy. Just having something to do, like knowing you matter to the world. At 21, I remember riding the metro and feeling nothing at all. Not sad, not anxious, just numb, and not thinking very much about anything. Please allow me to stay this way, I said to myself, as though praying. That's all I'll ever ask for. At 25, seated on the front steps of the McGill University Arts Building in the beginning of spring, I remember being told of Kurt Cobain's death. I'd just cut my thumb somehow, and as I gazed at the bright red bead on my finger, I almost passed out. The idea of someone so successful, so adored, so talented and rich, taking his own life, made me feel like a hole had been punctured and the darkness was slipping in. A journalist at the time referred to suicides in general as being like those party guests who leave early and make you think, yeah, maybe this isn't the funnest party after all. At 30, I published a book in which the Messiah had risen, and then nothing much else happens in the story. It might be built into my people's outlook, this life with no chance of change. At Jewish marriages, to symbolize the destruction of the temple, it's customary for the groom to step on a glass. Even in our gladdest moments, we are encouraged to ponder how all good things must end. Some good things end, but there are a lot of other good things that come by. Just focus on the other good things. Focus on having fun. There's always an end. Like it's, ine it's inevitable. And uh, that's, that's kind of what makes it more enjoyable. You know, because knowing that something's going to end, you can enjoy it for like having it now. Well, it's, well, you still have it in the palm of your hands. Is it our greatest shame that we secretly believe we will not die, that we matter, and everything we do matters? Or is it the triumph of all that is divine within us? Either everything matters or nothing does. Either all our tears are carried to heaven on winged stretchers, or they are not. While in a concentration camp infirmary, the psychologist Viktor Frankl had an epiphany. He was looking out the window at a tree when he realized that his experience of seeing that tree, how he chose to see it, in spite of all his suffering, was entirely of his own choosing. Either the tree matters because you make it matter, or it does not. It's our choice. As we enter hell, we either feel the first blast of heat, and like my grandfather entering the sauna, cry, it's a machaya, a joy, or we simply cry. I, I see that people often make the mistake of looking at the bad things as opposed to the good things. And, you know, there's so many bad moments every day as well as good moments. So if you just only look at the bad, you're just doing it wrong. In the end, you just have to live and enjoy and do what you want with your life in the current moment. And I like waking up and knowing that there's going to be so many interesting things, that I'm going to walk the dogs and there's going to be smells and sights and everything's going to be so interesting. Like, every day is such a big learning experience, so I really look forward to that. I think that if my life were to be characterized as some kind of struggle, it would be the struggle to never succumb entirely to despair to rage against the dying of the light, even though the darkness calls to me. And what gives me great solace, too, is remembering that really, we don't, in the big picture, know anything. No one does. And I love that. And I hold this ignorance close to my heart. A while ago, I was sitting around with my girlfriend when I said, probably apropos of nothing, how weird is it? 
that were on a planet. What's weirder, she replied, is that we figured it out. How weird that we're hurtling through space. How weird that we have intelligence. How weird that the planet that is our everything is spinning through the darkness and we don't know where it is heading, where all of this will lead. And all we smart people are along for the ride. All of us. Together. We all are given a certain amount of time on this planet and you can choose how to spend your time you can't choose how much time you have but you can choose what you do with it and personally I just say experience everything just going on adventures and just walking looking at the beauty of the world in the way that nothing makes sense and that it shouldn't be capable of existing and yet it does and then you can decide whether or not getting up is your thing Hey, Dad. Hi. Oh, Johnny? Yeah, hey, how you doing? All right, good. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. Uh, do you have a couple minutes? Sure. Why? Uh, well, I, I thought it, it might be fun to, uh, to play um, kind of a game show. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to explain what's the use of various modern items to a caveman. Okay, I'll try. All right, so I'm going to hit you with different things, and you're going to do your best to try to explain what the point of them is to someone who's never heard of them before. Okay, that could be difficult, but uh, we'll give it a shot. Yeah, um, and, and uh, to make it more uh, like a game show and more dramatic, I'm going to play some music under us. So I've, I've got a time limit, is that it? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the, the more that we can get through, the better. Okay. You ready to get started? Ready. Okay, first thing. What's the use of the wheel? This is a wheel, and it rolls. It rolls means that it goes around and around, and it can move faster. So the point is that it moves things faster. Yeah. Um, okay, next one. The written word. Okay, you, you, you have a stick. You paint pictures on your cave wall. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of painting pictures, you write things that tell people other things. For example, sometimes you got to write down something if you forget something. Like if you forget to cut the dinosaur or the meat or whatever it is that you got to cut, you write it down. Write it so you remember it's there permanently. All right, next one. What is the use of an ottoman? You don't have chairs, so you don't even know what a chair is. But a chair is something that you build to sit in. And sometimes you want your feet up, up. When you put, pick your feet up on something so you feel more relaxed, that's what an ottoman is. I don't know where that makes any sense. <laughs> it might not to a caveman. Oh. Um, what is the use of indoor plumbing? Oh, my God, indoor plumbing. You want to keep the where you relieve yourself as far away from the cave as possible because the odors could be pretty horrific. So you build a tube. And you get the tube and you rot, try to make it as long as you can. It may take a long time to make, but you bring it to the river. You put that tube in the river so that all the sewage will go in through the pipe, okay, and flush into the river. Let's move on to the next yeah. one. Yeah. What about a quiche? <laughs> When you have chickens running around in your cave, they lay eggs. And from these eggs, you break open the, the eggs, and the yolk comes, comes out, slips out, okay? Then you beat the egg up. I don't know how to make a kish, Johnny. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> but you got the uh, beating the egg up part, Yeah, it's a, it's made, I know a kish is made with eggs, yeah, but I really don't good. know oh, what the, the recipe for it is. 
Okay, next one. Um, high heels. High heels. The thing is, there's some people that want to seem like they're taller. They want to appear to be taller. So they put a heel that is higher in the back on. And they can, in turn, intimidate their enemies. Say you're going after a, a small antelope or a deer... Uh, or you want to scare off a predatory animal. So you put on your high heels. You put on your high heels, <laughs> and the animal will be scared off, like a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> so you think it would be practical to, to hunt saber-toothed tigers in, in a pair in of high, high heels? heels. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's try another one. Um, an exercise bicycle. Okay. Uh, you, there are times when you might eat a lot of meat, and if you eat a lot of meat... Too much uh, Tarantosaurus burgers, you get a paunch, you get a stomach, it's hanging over, okay? <laughs> so an exercise bike is like, it's, it has wheels. I explain what a wheel is, but the difference is a bike on wheels moves when you pedal it, but this goes nowhere, and you can do it right in your own cave, and you exercise. All right, um, let's try um, uh, liposuction. <laughs> Okay, sometimes exercise doesn't work very well, and you can't get rid of that paunch. So what happens, sometimes you go to the witch doctor, and he could open up a hole in your stomach, he sticks a tube in there, okay, and he sucks out all the extra fat out of there so that maybe your paunch goes down. That's called light, liposuction. All right, let's try one last one. What is the use of in an iPhone. An iPhone is a, a me- method of communication. You carry it around with you in your pocket sometimes. Well, you wait, what's, pull a, what's, it out. what's a pocket? A pocket is something that you have in your clothing in order to carry things. Or if you have a pouch that you wrap around your waist, you can carry that in there. <laughs> you mean, in other words, you mean a portable. fanny pack? A fanny pack. <laughs> and you put it into a fanny pack and carry I, it around. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know you have a fanny pack. I don't know if cavemen carry fanny packs. Well, they, then they, so they have some kind of bag that they carry their stuff. Okay. They have to have some kind of a skin-made bag of some sort. Okay. You carry the iPhone in that bag. Okay. And uh, you can use it for communicating with other people. People call you, you call them. But they wouldn't even have the internet or the electricity. to. They wouldn't understand that. Well, it would be impossible. You know, let's face it, we, you don't have internet, you don't have any electrical waves in the air, there's no things called Wi-Fi. Yeah. So in the end, what you could do is you could use it to crack nuts. Crack nuts. You could probably beat a small rodent to death that you can eat. You can always find use for something. How, how do you mean? Uh, if you're smart enough and then you have enough initiative, you could use anything at any particular time. You find a way. Even a, even an iPhone without electricity. Yeah. You could even take it and throw it at a bird. <laughs> and then eat the bird. <laughs> it always has uses. Everything has a use. That's pretty good. Okay. I think you did really well. Yeah, I hope so, Johnny. Well, we accomplished quite a lot. I think we yeah. got almost like about a dozen in there. Yeah, it was kind of silly, but, it, it, you know. Well, thank you for playing. Yeah, anytime. Johnny, how do you pronounce that? A liposuction or liposuction? Uh, did I pronounce it right? I don't know. I think so. I think, what did you say? Liposuction, I don't know. I think I've always heard it as liposuction. Lipo, that's the way I pronounce it. And you call it the lipo. Howard. Hey, John. What's what's going on? Just lying in bed. I um I hadn't heard from you in over a day already, and uh, I was I was just a little concerned. Every word is like an unnecessary stain on silence and nothingness. What is what is that coming from? I don't know. I heard it somewhere. Maybe on Star Trek. What what's going on? I don't really see any point in really doing anything, is what I've come to realize, I think. Are you, are you feeling okay? Yeah. Well, what what do you, what have you been up to? Nothing. Just lying here in bed, me and Brucey. We're having like a 
John and Yoko bet in. Uh, what, what are you protesting? Nothing. What's the point? What's all this coming from? You don't, you, I mean, you don't sound like you. It's cold out, it's snowy, it's gray, it's windy. I order delivery food, it comes cold. It's just the same thing day in, day out. Eat something, go to sleep, use the bathroom, rinse and repeat. Everything just stays the same. I mean, are you, are you feeling, are you depressed? No, I don't feel particularly depressed or anything. I just don't see, I mean, look, billions of people are just slaving away, working, working, for what? Even rich people, you get their money, they amass their, all their properties, and it all just turns to dust. We're all, we're all just dust in the wind. We're all just dust in the wind. Like that song. What song? Yeah, the song, Dust in the Wind. Oh, yeah? You can send it to me, but I, I probably won't even listen to it, because what's the point, really? You know? Uh-huh. That's it. There's, you've lost the point. Everything's futile. And there was never a point to lose. Well, it seemed like, you know, you used to have a point. I think I was just grasping, but I've resigned. I think I'm just, I'm just opting out of the big scam. It's like Timothy Leary used to say, just drop out, drop out, drop out. I that's, think that's there what, was... That's what I'm doing. There was some stuff in there about tuning in, also. To what? You ever shoot on TV? I can't watch that stuff. So this is it. You're just giving up on everything. Mm-hmm. I thought the world would be like Star Trek one day, but it's not going that way. It's going the opposite way. Everybody's texting, everybody's tweeting, but there's no message. Just round and round we go, round and round in a circle, buying, stuffing our faces, dying. But you love stuffing your face. I like stuffing my face, but I mean, you know, where does it all go? What's it all about? Nothing you can do. War, all the bad stuff going on, nothing stops. So, you know, I just, I figure I'm going to stop. Well, what about your, you, the dreams that you've, you've discussed with me? You know, I love to eat and stuff, and I yes. I thought maybe I'd become a competitive eater or something. That, that is I, one of your dreams, yeah. But, I mean, they're not enjoying themselves. All they're trying to do is fill the void. Billions upon billions of lives coming and going like ants, like moth poop. And for what? what what's brought this on? I, mean, I don't know. I, what, what's kept it away? Why didn't they teach me that in kindergarten? Class, this is just a pile of garbage, and there's no point... Period. Why even bother? It's pointless. Give up now. It would have been so easy. It's like I was born, and now I'm just going to sit there and just exist until I die. What? That, that, that sounds very spiteful. But, but but why should I have to fill up the space in between? So you're saying that if I offer to take you out for an expensive steak dinner, yeah, that isn't enough to to motivate you. No, I mean I mean at some point I will be hungry. If you want to bring the steak dinner over and just dump it into my bed, I'll just eat it. I don't need a plate or anything. That sounds I'll just great. Suck it out of the mattress. That sounds really nice. Maybe that's the ultimate revolution. Just stay in bed. Yeah, I just the way I see it now is I just see one big dark stinking cesspool reeking. <laughs> stop, Brucey. Brucey, stop. <laughs> he's licking my chin. Stop it. What? See how he does this when he wants to go for a walk. And he, no, Brucey. I'm sorry. No more walking. No more outside world, Brucey. That's a terrible thing to say to a dog. No, he's just, no he's, I'm going to teach him how to use the toilet. You use the toilet, huh? If you want. You know what? I don't even care, Brucey. Use the toilet. Don't use the toilet. How are you going to teach your pug to use a toilet? I don't know. He's nine years old. You think he'd know by now. It's the flushing. That's going to be the problem. But I don't care. Use the whole apartment as a toilet for all I care. The whole world's a toilet, John. One big toilet. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> hey, Brucey. Hey, he's trying to cheer me up. Uh, what, you want to go for a walk? Oh, he's tilting his head. You want to go for a walk? He doesn't understand what you're saying. He understands the walk part. He understands food, walk, and delivery. Those are the three words he knows. I mean, he doesn't know. I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess the good thing about being a dog is that he doesn't know that there's no point. Well, I think that's, I think that's healthy. Yeah, well, I mean... Uh, you know how maybe maybe the point is just, I guess, looking for a point. Just searching for it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what else can you what else can you do? Maybe, maybe so. I guess I could take him out for a quick walk or something like that. Maybe I'll stop and get a couple of movies on the way. And that's the spirit. Maybe it's too black here or two. 
I got to fuel the search, you know. Might as well maximize my nothingness. You got to make the most out of nothing. That's that's a step in the right direction, Hal. Woohoo. Okay, okay, Bruce, okay, okay, okay. All right, I got to go. He's going to go. I gotta take All right. So just so you know, by the way, I'm not, I'm not putting on pants. I'm just going to go with my bathrobe. Well, that's, that's, that's your business. That's right. Okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, Hal, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Okay. On Wiretap today, you heard Buzz Goldstein and Howard Chakowitz. Special thanks to Pamela Gomez and the students of Mind High School, who you heard at the beginning of today's show. Wiretap is produced by Mira Birdwintonic, Crystal Duhame, and me, Jonathan Goldstein. Tune into Wiretap Saturdays at 3.30 and Thursday evenings at 11.30. Like us on Facebook, review the show on iTunes, and subscribe to the free podcast at cbc.ca slash wiretap where you can also download the latest wiretap ringtone. Put on your high heels and the animal will be scared off like a saber-toothed tiger. A reminder that you can be both fearsome and fashionable with every ring of your phone.